since it's nine o'clock? Good morning, everyone. So glad to welcome you to the first Natural Capital Conversation. Today, we'll be talking about the Anthropocene Ocean. Uh, first, I thought I would start with a few introductory remarks. The Natural Capital Project is centered at Stanford University and we've got five core partners shown here on the screen. We are pioneering science, technology and partnerships that enable people and nature to thrive. We started these natural capital conversations because we found that we missed the lively and thought provoking sessions at our annual symposium at Stanford. And we thought we'd try taking them online. So these are conversations that are designed to spark engaging discussion, learn from others' experiences and promote connections with collaborators old and new. The various events will feature everything from climate smart coastal planning to cultural ecosystem services and more. And um, just a few little housekeeping things. First of all, a recording of this webinar will be available at our YouTube channel and a copy of the slides that are presented today will be included in a thank you email after the event. In terms of questions and answers and chats, just to get you oriented, if you have questions for the speakers, please use the question and answer box. And if you have technical challenges or have questions about logistics, use the chat box. And we'll remind you of this again when we uh, get to the Q&A section. Here's the schedule after opening remarks. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Jouffre, who is a postdoc at the Stockholm Resilience Center, whose work focuses on the interlinked social, economic, and ecological challenges that shape the new global ocean. He will introduce all of the panelists. We'll take a break from 9.45 to 9.50, and then we will begin the discussion and Q&A. And then we'll wrap up with uh, a few announcements about upcoming conversation series that we hope that you will join us for. And with that, I will turn it over to Jean-Baptiste. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all uh, involved in the Natural Capital Project for organizing this series of conversation and giving us the opportunity to discuss the Anthropocene Ocean with such a fantastic panel. And of course, uh, thank you to all four panelists for accepting the invitation and, and joining me today. Back when I was in high school, I remember my uh, philosophy teacher telling me that as soon as we get a subject on the table for the essay, well, the first thing we should do is to actually extract each one, each word of the, of the topic of the subject and define them. And that will help us get started. And I figured this was quite fitting today, since we have only two words that shouldn't get us too far. So the Anthropocene and the ocean. The Anthropocene, it describes a new epoch where humans have become the dominant force of planetary change with profound impacts on the Earth biosphere and the climate system upon which so many people depend. It is characterized by increasing speed, scale and connectivity and it depicts an age where people, places, cultures, economies, and technologies are connected across geographical location, sectors, and socioeconomic context in unprecedented ways. Some argue the Anthropocene should be a distinct geological era following up on the Holocene and marking the age of humans. Others ignore these debates and prefer to look at the Anthropocene as an analytical framework to explore what this new reality means for social ecological system and their capacity to support human societies. Indeed, 
a key challenge for humanity in the Anthropocene is to understand its new role as dominant force of planetary change and how to enable transformation towards a more sustainable and equitable Anthropocene. In particular, in the context of the ocean. So what is the ocean? Well, that's a life support system. It produces oxygen, it absorbs excess heat, it regulates the climate, and essentially it covers more than 70% of the planet. It also provides food, economic opportunity, and livelihood to billions of people. Yet the prospect of a new era of blue growth that we're experiencing today poses unprecedented sustainability and governance challenges as marine ecosystems face cumulative pressures from local human impacts, global climate change, and distal socioeconomic drivers. So the point of this session today is to explore what the Anthropocene means for the ocean and how to steer it in a sustainable and equitable way. 2020 was supposed to be the super year for the ocean with the UN Ocean Conference, the COP26, and so on. It obviously did not happen. And those events have been postponed to 2021. 2021 marks also the beginning and the start of the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It actually started literally 27 days ago, 1st of January, and it will go on until 2030. We have the Blue Cup, COP26, at the end of the year. We also have the UN Ocean Conference in the fall. We have the food system, which is no, less, no least relevant for the ocean, con considering blue food and seafood. So there is some kind of momentum around the ocean. And today, the idea is, well, what about the two words together? What about Anthropocene and what about ocean? And how to make sense of it? Well, it is my pleasure not to have to answer those questions and instead to introduce our four distinguished speakers, starting with Elizabeth Selig, Deputy Director of the Center for Ocean Solution at Stanford University. Um, her work focuses on analyzing how changes in ecosystem health will affect ecosystem services and human well-being, and how to design and evaluate the success of management tools to effectively manage resources. Elizabeth, you have long experience working with international organizations such as Conservation, International, the Smithsonian Institution, or the World Resource Institute. Your research covers a wide range of topics from marine ecology and conservation, including the role of marine protected areas, to coral reef, climate change, fisheries, and the seafood industry in general. But I think that being said, one common thread throughout your work has been, and still is, to apply an integrated social ecological lens and to really look at the social ecological interdependencies of sustainable development. And I think this is something that should be obvious from your presentation today about the human dependence on marine ecosystem. Our second speaker will be Douglas McCauley, professor at University of California, Santa Barbara and director of the Benioff Ocean Initiative. I think broadly speaking, Douglas work focuses on understanding the ecology of communities and ecosystem in a rapidly changing world. Research in your lab is directed at understanding how community structure influences ecosystem dynamics in determining how ecosystems are interactively and energetically coupled to one another and quantifying how humans disturb these dynamics and shape patterns of biodiversity. To design solution to the problem confronting ocean health, you draw from disciplines such as community ecology, biogeochemistry, conservation biology, and anthropology, and often use emerging tech and big data to conduct spatial analysis and ecological modeling. Ultimately, your work aims at generating results that both advance the science of ecology and can be used by decision makers. Today, you will introduce us to the rapidly growing industrialization of the ocean and its possible consequences. Then we will hear from John Virdin, Director of the Coastal and Ocean Policy Program at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solution at Duke University. You have expertise in studying and advising government policies to regulate human use of the ocean particularly marine conservation policies to reduce poverty throughout the tropics. The program you're directing aim at connecting science and policymakers to solve ocean sustainability problem. Your focus has been largely on managing fisheries for food and livelihood, expanding to broader ocean-based economic development policies, coastal adaptation, and more recently, issues such as ocean plastic pollution and the role of large corporation in the ocean economy. Prior to joining Duke University in your previous life, you spent more than a decade working at the World Bank, where you focused on increasing its funding for ocean conservation and fisheries, 
and also managed the World Bank's Global Partnership for Oceans, a coalition of more than 150 governments, companies, NGOs, philanthropies, and multilateral agencies. Yet today, government won't be the focal point of your talk. Instead, you will tell us more about the world's largest corporation active in the ocean economy. And last, not but, last but not least, in the context of the Natural Capital Project is Jan Bebington, Professor of Accounting and Sustainable Development, Director of the Pentland Center for Sustainability in Business at Lancaster University in UK. This is a transdisciplinary center. And prior to that, I think I believe it's a recent appointment, prior to that you were at the University of Birmingham, after having also been head of the School of Management at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. Your expertise is in social, environmental, and sustainability accounting topics, but I think it's fair to say that overall you are a sustainability expert who has spent her, her whole academic career focusing on the whole organization through accounting and reporting activities can contribute to sustainable development trajectories. You're known to build bridges, not only within science between different academic disciplines, but also between science and policy, and importantly, between science and industry. You have been instrumental in shaping many government policies and well, and as well as science industry collaboration, not least with your work within the seafood business for ocean stewardship and, and the largest seafood companies in the world in collaboration with the Stockholm Resilience Center and Stanford University, among others. And today, I think your intervention will be particularly relevant for the Natural Capital Project, as you will tell us more about the role of accounting and organization in the Anthropocene. So once again, a warm welcome Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And thank you to all the panelists. And I think with no further ado, uh, we shall start with Elizabeth Selig. The screen is yours. Thank you. Give me one moment. Let me share my slides. So first of all, I just want to begin by saying thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm really excited to be a part of this panel of so many great ocean folks and also to have a chance to talk with you about our work in mapping human dependence on marine ecosystems. I think an important focus of the last several years has been to try to identify critical natural capital, these ecosystems that support incredible biodiversity, but also supply um, critical ecosystem services. At the same time, I think it's important to think about what critical natural capital means in the Anthropocene Ocean, as we ask more and more of the ocean in order to provide the benefits that we need and increasingly use it um, in new ways, including offshore aquaculture development and renewable energy development. We sort of try to reconcile this by thinking about what are the ways in which humans depend on the oceans. And the way in which we began to explore this question was to think about what are the ways, what are the types of dependence that human populations have on the ocean. And through an expert working group process, we identified four key types of dependence. Nutritional dependence, where people depend on marine ecosystems for their food security or nutritional benefits. Economic dependence, where people depend on marine ecosystems for their jobs or revenues to, to governments. Coastal protection dependence, where critical ecosystems like salt marshes, mangroves, and coral reefs provide important buffering from storm events. And cultural dependence, where marine ecosystems are a key part of cultural um, or religious identity. We then try to think about mapping out these types of dependence, and we, we um, we met our match early on with cultural dependence, but it was exciting to see that that will be a topic of, um, of future talks within this series. So we're focusing primarily in this, um, in this talk on nutritional, economic, and coastal protection dependence. The second thing we did was to try to think about what is a conceptual model that actually describes um, human dependence on marine ecosystems. And we think of this dependence as a function of three key components, the magnitude of the benefits that are being provided, the susceptibility of the population to a loss of those benefits, and the substitutability of those benefits in some other way. So what this looks like for nutritional dependence when we think about key indicators or potential proxies to look at these things, 
For the magnitude of benefits, it could be the percent of animal dietary protein from marine sources. For susceptibility, it could be some metric of malnourishment, looking at the percent of underweight children. And substitutability, it could be GDP or dietary diversity. In other words, do you have um, the ability to go out and buy an alternative? And if you do, is there an alternative even available? When we put these together and mapped out nutritional dependence, um, we found a couple of strike, a few striking um, results. One is that nutritional dependence represents one of the key ways in which human populations rely on marine ecosystems. It's over 500 million people are nutritionally dependent on marine ecosystems. But the ways in which you get to the sort of high, the, the, the dark red on this map or high dependence can be very different. So for example, Iceland, Norway, Japan, South Korea are all countries that have very high consumption or high magnitude of benefits, even though they have the ability to go out and purchase alternatives. And so their nutritional dependence is almost a cultural preference um, for, for seafood in the diet. Whereas other places, nutritional dependence is a function more of a susceptibility of the population to a loss of those benefits and a lack of alternative options. And that's more true of some of the countries around coastal West Africa. So I think this was a, this really brought home to us the idea that it's important not only to understand where people are dependent, but also the mechanisms that create that dependence. When we mapped economic dependence, we were struck, um, first of all, by the fact that a couple of countries um, were important for both nutritional and economic dependence, and that included a lot of um, island nations in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, and also that there were some key differences between countries um, that, that, were, that had um, high nutritional dependence and those that had high economic. Economic dependence here looks at both jobs and livelihoods. And so to try to understand and tease apart um, what might be happening kind of under, under the surface there, we calculated them both separately as well. to Try to understand which countries are most reliant on marine ecosystems for revenue versus livelihoods. And you can see for revenue, um, several Pacific Island um, nations that um, rely on revenues from tuna access agreements come up as being highly reliant for revenues, whereas countries where small scale fisheries are very important um, are, are more economically dependent for their livelihoods. When we map coastal protection dependence, you can see that the patterns are quite different um, from either nutritional or economic dependence. And this is largely a function of where ecosystems that provide coastal protection services are, are located. This is um, using coral reefs and mangroves and where cyclonic storms um, are most likely to affect coastal populations. When we look across all three types of dependence, we find that more than 775 million people worldwide are dependent on marine ecosystems. Our results suggest that management and policy will need to be tailored to the type of dependence present and the mechanisms that create it. At the same time, there are trade-offs. If you try to manage for, um, for increased revenues, for example, you may have negative consequences for fisheries livelihoods. But I think it's important to think about um, a better understanding and representation of where and how people are dependent on marine ecosystems to be able to integrate them more fully, not only into conversations around ecosystem management, but also around poverty alleviation and sustainable development. With the hope is that that takes us a step towards being able um, to have an Anthropocene ocean that not only supports functioning ecosystems, but also thriving coastal communities. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And I think uh, there is no better way to start than actually hammering down this notion of social and ecological. Indeed, it's not only about functioning ecosystem, it's also about functioning communities. And I think something you highlight is 
is we will come back to it with this disparity and heterogeneity of the ocean and its benefits uh, across the globe. So thanks a lot for that and, and for highlighting those key aspects of human dependence, nutritional, economic, coastal protection, and cultural. Now uh, I'm turning towards Douglas McCauley to maybe bring us on a journey for what this dependence or, or not necessarily dependence looks like and what, can, what shapes it takes uh, over time. Douglas, it's yours. Thank you, Jean Baptiste, and, and thank you, Liz, for really wonderful framing and uh, really interesting results. So the thing that strikes me most about the Anthropocene Ocean is indeed today the, the relative lack of Anthropocene in the ocean, and perhaps that's made more or less evident with this first image here of New York City looking down on the city. If you were to hand, head out in one of the boats moving back and forth into the marine sector of New York City, you might in any given year encounter hundreds, say 200, 300 um, whales a year, mega mammals wild and cruising in that marine sector. You can answer in your own head exactly how many mega mammals you would actually find cruising the streets wild in the terrestrial sector of that city, which is to say that uh, this general motif that comes in us, this impression that comes at us from New York City, that there's a very strong boundary around where the Anthropocene is, has propagated from land to sea is very real in many places across our planet. The human, human footprint is much more well developed, it's much more mature, it's much more intense, I think it's fair to say, on land than in the ocean. However, I think that discontinuity of human impact across the land to sea boundary is in fact, um, that border and that discontinuity is breaking down. We are seeing bit by bit um, a rapid acceleration of humanity, of human influence, of the human footprint into our oceans. There are dozens of brand new industries that are now beginning in the oceans and old industries that are ramping up in the sea. Let's take, for example, aquaculture, where um, thousands of years ago on land, we made the transition quite successfully and, uh, and unidirectionally from hunting our dinners, hunting for food on land to farming with transformative impacts on ocean, on terrestrial ecosystems. We're now seeing that same transition from hunting to becoming farmers in the sea, big time in the ocean. Uh, things, industries that were science fiction when I was a child, like ocean mining are now becoming real. We've now gazetted about a million square kilometers of our global ocean in um, a mining claim areas, which we may begin commercially mining um, within the next several years. If you move from industry to industry, you see this kind of acceleration, whether it's uh, oil and gas, ocean mining, desalinization, shipping traffic, whether that's crews or commerce, building power plants in the oceans, coastal growth, um, the amount of infrastructure we're putting in for communications on and on and on from sector to sector for, our, uh, uh, for different industries that are beginning new or continuing in the oceans. You see what I think Jean-Baptiste and colleagues um, at uh, Stockholm Resilience Center really crystallized so well this concept of a blue acceleration, rapid acceleration sector by sector by sector for industry in our oceans. Now, what's really interesting to me, this new um, change in the pace of the way that the Anthropocene is moving into the oceans is that this is not our world's first rodeo for rapid accelerations of industry on the planet. The first of these rapid accelerations, I would say, began during the Industrial Revolution on land, about the 17 or 1800s, when we had all kinds of new accelerations, industries, new industries, expansions of cities, expansions of the need to draw energy and resources into power industries um, in these cities, in these factories associated with this revolution. There was good and there was bad that came out of this first Industrial Revolution for our planet. Many very useful, very positive products from the vantage point of humanity came off these assembly lines, advances in medicine, new kinds of advances in humanity or in mobility that brought people closer together. But again, there was also uh, a whole suite of different products coming out of these factories that uh, were negative for planet and people. Consider, of course, the case of this river in Ohio, which caught fire not once but 13 times as a result of pollution. We, during the Industrial Revolution, invented products um, like air pollution and water pollution and acid rain, products that were not intended consequences or not intended products of the Industrial Revolution. 
when we think a bit about what this rapid industrialization meant on land and might mean in, in oceans, there are dozens, hundreds of different currencies. When we think about this from the vantage point of biodiversity, maybe we can focus in just as an indicator on the currency of extinction. Somewhat simple, simple, but also clear in terms of its binary nature, a species alive, a species is not alive. If you zoom back uh, to about uh, uh, 500 years ago, you can see that the number of cumulative extinctions that we're adding onto our planet is relatively low in the domains both of land and sea prior to this rapid industrialization, first industrialization on land. So we move forward to the 1700s and 1800s is when we begin to see more and more and more and more species added to the extinction register on land. However, that line for extinction in the oceans remains flat in a good way, all the way out more or less to the present. So perhaps there was something fundamental and that's a subject for a long conversation. What did change during this industrial revolution, which also changed the impact we were having on our planet and then the feedbacks between those impacts we had on planet and biodiversity and all of our own well-being. But suffice to say, something fundamental changed in our relationship with nature in that period. So what's really fascinating and intriguing um, to me is that in some ways, this period in the past on land, this first industrial revolution for our planet on land can serve perhaps as a, as a crystal ball of sorts as we look forward towards predicting and more importantly, managing what the future of a second industrial revolution may become in our oceans. The thing that's extremely exciting to me is that concurrent with this rapid acceleration of all industry that we're beginning in the oceans and the extension of the Anthropocene and the human footprint into our oceans is that we have another revolution brewing alongside the extension of humanity into the sea, which is that we have a revolution in our capacity to actually track sea document and hopefully guide what this next big industrialization becomes from the ocean. That's data that's coming from sensors that are placed on all of those ships, whether they're fishing or transiting across our oceans. That's data that's coming from remote sensing um, platforms like satellites that allow us to see down to 30 centimeters resolution what we're doing to some of these coastal ecosystems that Liz referenced that provide such important services for coastal societies. So in sum, if we're um, thinking about another big revolution for a big part of our planet, this being perhaps even a bigger industrial revolution for a larger part of our planet, there are going to be some very important consequences that come from this ocean industrial revolution and from the movement of the Anthropocene into the oceans, consequences that come again both for nature and people, but we're empowered in an exciting way to perhaps do this better at sea than we did on land. We can imagine traveling back to the beginning of the industrial revolution on land. And if we had the richness of data that we have now, then perhaps we could have got more of the good and less of the bad. I would say in the years going forward, we have a really important responsibility, really exciting opportunity to try to think creatively with science, with policymakers about how to leverage the power of this data to make sure that the ocean Anthropocene as we see more and more of it becomes something that's positive for oceans and for people that depend on oceans. John Matisse, so much more to say, but perhaps let me pause there. Well, thank you, Douglas. I think so much has already been said and, and, and point being made. Um, indeed, I think while ocean uses has happened for thousands of years, like human use of the ocean, clearly what your presentation shows is that the extent, the intensity, and somehow the diversity of today's aspiration are unprecedented. And in fact, the, the expansion of humanity into the ocean space is unprecedented. And, and so I like the optimistic note at the end to say that with that comes also an acceleration of technologies and of innovation that should theoretically allow us to hopefully do things better. Uh, and I guess we, we will get back to that in the question. But as the ocean becomes increasingly industrialized, um, who are those industries? And who says industries, says companies, says private sector. So now I'm turning towards John Virdin, uh, who has looked into it, who has looked into this rapidly growing ocean economy and who were the big actors behind it. John. John, I think you're muted. Yes, thank you so much, JB. Let me just uh, share my, my screen here and um, bear with me if I find uh, 
find my files here that uh no worries that i seem to be a little bit first let me say thanks to you and to to having me and to join such a distinguished group of panels and thank you in particular to um to following on doug's presentation which i cannot uh frankly can't imagine a a better start to to what i want to share which is really if we are industrializing the oceans and if um, if human use of the oceans is growing in the Anthropocene, then who is really accelerating in the ocean space, and who is the uh, who's industrializing here in in the ocean? So that's what I want to talk about briefly right now, and just to to share with you a little bit of a study that um, that JB and I and and several others from from Duke and Stockholm Resilience Center just looked at, which is to say. Can we get a, an initial estimate, an initial uh, snapshot of who are the largest companies operating in the ocean economy? That portion of the global economy that's defined by the ocean as a shared operating space or an input into production. And we were, what we tried to do is apply the, the idea and the, the concept that, that Henrik Osterblum and, and JBU and others at Stockholm have been using of looking at keystone species in an ecosystem, those species that have an outsized role in the structure and function of an ecosystem, and applying that to industries with global supply chains to see if, if certain companies have an outsized role to play in these industries and how they interact with the environment. So we took an initial look at this for the year 2018 and wanted to see if in fact, there are a relatively small number of large companies that play an outsized role in the ocean economy and who's, if these are the companies that have been driving the blue acceleration uh, that you mentioned, JB, and that are really poised to, to be the leaders here as we, we start this age of ocean industrialization that, that Doug mentioned may be coming. So when we looked across eight core industries of the ocean economy, um, based on the OECD's definition, what we see is a pretty consistent pattern across all of them, whether it be offshore oil and gas, whether it be the emerging industry of offshore wind that's grown so much over the last decade or two, uh, shipping, ports, marine equipment, seafood, uh, cruise tourism, across the board, we see essentially that the 10 biggest companies in each of these industries generated on average about 45% of the total revenues from those industries in the year 2018. Essentially giving us an indication that actually a relatively small number of companies are generating most of the revenues in, uh, in the ocean economy and potentially are playing an outsized role in humanity's interaction with, with the oceans, at least through, through these industries and the, and the ocean economy. So we looked across these, these industries, see who are the biggest players, who are the, the 100 biggest companies in the, the ocean economy. You probably won't be surprised to see that uh, almost half of them are offshore oil and gas companies. Um, and then after that, when we, we take out offshore oil and gas and look at the remaining um, large companies in the, in the ocean economy, you see Maersk and a number of shipping companies are some of the largest. It's a little bit more widely dispersed from shipping, shipbuilding and repair to seafood, um, cruise tourism, wind, a number of these kind of more mature industries as well as emerging, so to speak, like offshore wind. Um, factor in there. And again, we just see this, this pattern of concentration in, uh, of revenues in a relatively small number of companies across these industries. Looking at then, okay, where, where are they on land? Where are these, where are these industries, where are these companies based? Um, we see similarly that whether it's offshore oil and gas or, or different sectors, shipping, shipbuilding and repair, most of these large ocean-based companies are headquartered in a relative handful of countries, whether it's the US and Europe, uh, China, to a lesser extent, Japan, or Brazil and, and the Middle East there, Saudi Arabia, in terms of offshore oil and gas. Um, so again, it just, it indicated to us starting to get a sense of well, really, who is accelerating in human use of the ocean and economic use of the oceans in the, in the Anthropocene? And, and where is this happening from? 
it seems to be, if we just use revenues as a proxy, it seems to be across the ocean economy, across many of these kind of core ocean-based industries, a relative handful of companies uh, based out of a handful of countries. And so one of the things I just wanted to, to kind of close out on and, and think about that with that is if indeed there are a relative handful of companies generating most of the revenues from economic use of the oceans, if this is the structure of what we call the, the ocean economy uh, as we approach kind of the blue acceleration and, and ocean industrialization, does that mirror who's uh, using the ocean, where the jobs are, where the livelihoods are? Is, is we, can we think about sort of capital and labor in the ocean economy? And I went back to, to what Liz mentioned, which is how many people depend upon the oceans for food and nutrition and it, through small scale fisheries, one of the oldest uses of the ocean space. And there, if we just compare the OECD's 2010 employment figures across many of these industries with some of our best, uh, albeit pretty rough guesses or estimates of the total number of people employed in small scale fisheries, there's just no comparison. Far more people employed in, in small scale fisheries as the ocean's largest employer than, than many of these other industries combined. So we're just starting to think about what does that mean in terms of the distribution of capital and labor in economic use of the oceans in the Anthropocene? If many of the most of the revenues are concentrated in the hands of a few very large companies, much of the employment is in uh, small scale fisheries distributed dispersed widely uh, around the globe and particularly throughout the tropics. And really, what does that mean for the influence and, and power of, of different ocean users and, and for ocean governance in the Anthropocene? So I'll stop there, but that's just a, a sense of, of how we're starting to think about at least who's using the ocean uh, economy, who is accelerating um, as we think about ocean industrialization in the Anthropocene. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, so interesting presentation, and I think very much speaking to this also often a, a critic of the, of the term itself, Anthropocene, which would assume that all humans are considered equal, right? It's like humans have become a dominant force of planetary change. I think, if anything, your presentation shows that maybe it's not all humans that have become a dominant force of planetary change, and it has uh, consequences for, for sustainability, but also for equity, which we will get back to, I'm sure, during the, the Q&A. I would also love to overlay your maps of the headquarter of those companies with the maps we saw from Lee's early on about the human dependence. And I think the, the mismatch would be extremely striking between those countries that depend the most on the ocean and yet where the revenues from the ocean are actually flowing. Because if anything, I think you have highlighted the world's 100 largest corporate beneficiaries of ocean use today. And, and I think that raises a, a lot of question. Now, this corporation, these large TNCs are are quite something. And, and I can think of no better to, to conclude the lineup of speakers, but also to enlighten us in terms of cooperation, in terms of organization. What are those and how to deal with those than Jan de Bington? I think you're muted, Jan. <laughs> I'm so busy with my slides, I'm muting myself. Uh, so thank you so much, JB, and thank you so much for making space for an accountant um, in, in your discussions. And I want to now think more carefully about organisations themselves and some of the generic issues with regard to how they both create and might be able to mitigate um, Anthropocene impacts. And in particular, um, we're going to focus on, on transnational corporations. So these are corporations that manage production and or deliver services in more than one country. And in this respect, they directly do that because indirectly, um, we are all transnational beings because of these indirect um, links that we've got when we buy things or eat food and, 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 and live our daily lives. But these are the organizations that directly have touchdown points in more than one place and actually produce materials um, on a result, as a result of it. And I want to really echo Doug's point because 
TNCs are as old as the Industrial Revolution. And indeed, some of the key and first TNCs were really, really nasty organizations that were owned by countries. So the East India Company, for example, that controlled a, a, a great deal of India on behalf of the British, um, the British Crown, as it was then. So in that respect, um, whilst TNCs are now not always owned by countries, although some of them are, um, that's now been decoupled, but the same sense of effect is going on, whereby one part of the world is, is affected by organisations that are based elsewhere, and John's work really draws that out. And with regard to TNCs, there was an equivalent great acceleration in the last 50 to 70 years of a growing size of these organizations, a greater distribution across the globe and also a greater um, a concentration of power. So to say something about these organizations and try to understand them, what you need to understand and what I, well, I'm going to try to talk you into is that how they measure and manage what they do really matters. And um, here I should say that, that my pictures aren't as great as the others because I, I could have shown you a, a cheeky wee picture of a balance sheet, but it would be just so boring to anyone. Um, it's it's you know, quite boring to me and I'm an accountant. And so here is one of the hidden powers of accounting and the kind of rules and technical and, and know-how that sit beneath organizational practices is that we think they're so boring they're not worth looking at. And they are kind of boring, but they produce effects on the world. And these effects have a great impact when we're thinking about um, the Anthropocene. And in particular, we would see accounting um, producing a bunch of impacts for organizations. So it creates spaces where we might decide what matters. So here, prices, costs, compensation for work, taxes paid, but critically, not externalities because they're external from that mechanism and how we measure um, the calculative spaces where, where organizations operate. Um, once you've got numbers, you can start coming together and exchanging those numbers with each other. And so we would call that commensuration and that you turn one thing into financial numbers. So you turn people's productive work into wages. And then you start thinking about the next step, which allows you to evaluate things. So you talk about productivity, you might talk about value for money, or you might talk about cost benefit analysis. And in each one of these stages, if you like, we extract further away from the activities of, of actual people in actual places until finally you get these contexts where you can exercise control in financial capital terms, not in natural capital terms except in so far as financial measures capture natural capital values. And there is a you know, whole debate in there as to whether or not um, it's appropriate to price the natural capital in some way. But at the moment it is priced, but it's probably priced incorrectly because of externalities and because we know where we've created these negative Anthropocene effects. So my work really focuses on how would you hold organizations accountable in the Anthropocene? And this is where it starts getting quite varied and quite difficult because it depends on two things. For organizations, they are distinguished by purpose and by their ownership structure. In terms of purpose, um, you've got the profit and the not-for-profit sectors. Now the not-for-profit side of things can be extremely large, um, particularly if you put health and education in, out of the, the for-profit sector. These are very large activities that take place in each country. Mostly TNCs are for-profit organizations, though. so they fit within some kind of um, framework where they're trying to maximize their, um, their profits. Um, they are across the globe, but they are critically also local. TNCs and every organization has to headquarter somewhere. And the rules that govern how an organization must behave are critically determined by that headquartered location, but then also by the rules where they operate as well. And this is where tax havens become really critical because if you're headquartered somewhere with quite poor standards of transparency and governance, then it's very hard for anyone to actually hold you accountable. In terms of ownership, you've got privately owned, this and um, some very large corporations are privately owned, but they're often family owned, publicly owned, and by that we mean those shares are exchanged on the stock market. Um, this is, if you like, quite often what a typical transnational looks like, is it will be a 
privately owned but publicly exchanged um, um, in terms of ownership. But there's also a large um, stake in the ocean in publicly owned organizations. Um, so the previous um, presentation looked at state-owned oil and gas, and they are very, very large organizations, but also you can imagine thinking about distant water fleets belonging to a government as being a state-owned um, transnational um, corporation and its transnational effects. The difficulties we have with managing and controlling organizations is that by and large, those who own the organization are different from the people who operate them. And so there's almost a dual um, route into affecting organizations' behavior, some of it with their owners, so their formal shareholders, and other ones with the managers. And both of them would be important routes for change. The power of organizations then is, is because they, if you like, the rules of the game economically have been designed for their benefit, then um, they are very powerful institutions. Likewise, and I think um, you know, the presentations have highlighted, they're pivotal in many contexts, either in places or in particular industries. But then their norms become our norms as well. So this whole sort of push to neoliberalism, um, the idea of efficiency being the most important thing rather than equity, uh, is sort of brought to us and infused through our society through organisations. But they are ultimately governable. And the strength of governance is one way of actually um, make, ensuring organisations play a positive role um, in the, the Anthropocene, but then also organizations themselves have views about what good conduct looks like, um, particularly through green clubs, et cetera. So what are the possibilities for change then? Well, it does mean that you have to figure out what you mean by change. So is it a change in actions, change in effects, or change in underlying ethos? I'd say it's going to be hard to change underlying ethos of current for-profit organizations, but with good, um, Good management, it is possible to change their effects. It might also be possible for them to think about being stewards of the natural environment rather than being extractors from it. In terms of the change versus stability, it is assumed organisations are seeking stability. They're quite hard to change, but they do change, usually after there's some sort of jolt or shock. It's a time when organisations can move quite rapidly to do something quite different. But also, and this is where the strength of the analysis that John's undertaking becomes really important, is that change travels through a system, and you might think about some norms that, that tip over into whole industries, and this is where the Keystone Actors approach is, is shows some promise, because you can propagate change through the system by organisations affecting each other and seeking to be similar to each other, and hence changing what they do. Organisations are also within whole webs of, of influence. Um, I sometimes describe them as complex adaptive systems inside complex adaptive systems. So you'll see how difficult it is as a, a researcher to really understand exactly what organisations are doing because they, they're very diverse and they, can, they change their impacts very rapidly and might be very different in different places. But also then a lot of people talk about stakeholder influence. So these are people or groups that are affected by organizations or who can affect them. I'd be cautious about thinking stakeholder influence is uh, enormously powerful. It can be at times, but mostly the power differential is so large that stakeholders have relatively little leverage on organizational change. And then finally, on a, a bit of a gloomy uh, <laughs> note, um, Listed organisations may be the least able to change because our financial markets are dominated by short term thinking and are not very ecologically literate. Um, these companies might not have people who are able to understand and articulate what change looks like. So if you're trying to understand what's happening with organisations, th th there's some key questions that I've left here. So um, some of the things we haven't really picked up on, which are really important, though, are the insurance companies and what they will and won't they won't insure. Stock exchanges have different demands of organisations, um, although it's probably worth realising stock exchanges are also private companies. Um, they're, they're run for profit by a different group of people. Industry bodies are hugely important because they develop new norms and promulgate those norms throughout um, a process. CEOs matter. So there's a recent study that suggests that up to 30% of 
pro-social attitudes from organizations are driven by their CEOs. So the leadership really matters. And then it depends you know, how, where people are, how they're governed, how they're regulated, how big their impacts are. So to try to draw all that together um, is that organizations are, are complex, they're adaptive. They have this global reach, but they can also be steered onto more sustainable and equitable paths, but, but not easily. That has to be done self-consciously with another group of actors, where they be regulators, owners, financiers, either banks, insurance companies, uh, consumers, um, sort of everyone. So they're, they're a really interesting uh, feature to examine because that's where my academic life rests, but they are also you know, quite slippery characters to be examining as well. Well, thank you, Jan. As always, I think horizon expanding <laughs> presentation and topics um, from tax seven to financial institution to the need, if I hear you correctly, to change not only the companies, but maybe the whole financial market, since some are locked in into short term profits. Uh, I think this is really interesting. It's really nice follow up to this identification of the Ocean 100, because I guess for an accountant like you, researcher at least, it gives you uh, quite a cohort to, to dive into and, and, and to, to bite in. So I'm sure we will get back to that. Um, we're almost on time, so we will take a three minute break. Uh, we'll come back at 55 of whatever your time is, wherever you are in the world. So a three minute breaks, and then we come back for a QA and a session. So please do not hesitate to write down question in the Q&A. Um, if you want to direct them at a specific speaker, do so. If they're more general, just write the question. We will try to go through as many of those as possible. Thanks again, and, and see you in three minutes. 55.
All right. It's 1855 my time. It should be 955 till of the West Coast. 555 for you, Jen, in UK. And I'll invite all panelists to turn on the video and join me. Thank you so much. Here we are. Yes. So I think we've, we've uh, it's wonderful. We've already received a bunch of questions. Some of those have been answered. I think Liz has been quicker than anyone else in, in already <laughs> answering some of those questions. So I suggest for the time being, because they keep coming. So I will just take them uh, as, as they come. And so going back up, I believe Douglas, you were next in line with the question about the, the growth of extension, land versus ocean, if you want to take this one. Sure. Um, so let's see, there is a, the question about um, growth of extinctions and uh, the question in essence asks, um, which is a really good question, asks whether or not the, the flat line or the diminished amount of extinction that's apparent in the oceans um, or putatively apparent in the oceans, whether that's being underrepresented, underrepresented by the challenges in detecting extinction in the sea, which is an absolutely good question, which is that uh, it's much easier to detect extinctions on land um, than it would be in the oceans. And think, for example, of the challenges that came from trying to find um, the Titanic, the world's most famous ship and a 50,000 ton vessel, right? It took us about 75 years to find that in the ocean. Imagine how challenging it might be to find a diminutive shrimp that has gone extinct as a result of trawling or something in the sea. So it's a very good observation that we have less detectability of extinction in the oceans. So we can't necessarily rule out the uh, possibility that extinction and this uh, um, apparent um, lower level of extinction in the ocean it results from this detectability bias. However, I'd say that the magnitude of extinction on land and ocean is really so great. The last I checked in on um, IUCN extinction um, statistics, it was about 500 documented extinctions on land versus approximately 15 um, animal extinctions in the oceans. And so the, the level of difference is so large that uh, I would at least suggest, or my first hypothesis is that there is something very um, real about this difference in extinction land versus sea. As we advance forward and um, learning more about the oceans, perhaps we'll get a better handle on uh, detecting these extinctions and a more um, accurate rate to compare extinctions and land in the oceans. Um, and there's a handful of mechanisms that I think are very real. In brief, because I want to hear answers to other questions. In brief, I think, uh, as I mentioned, there is something I think causative about the industrial revolution on land, which perhaps was a driving force for this uh, accelerated extinction rate on land. And that is that uh, when we switched from hunting individual species, when you hunt a mammoth, you might be able to drive it extinct, or when you overhunt a deer, it's the same. But when you hunt an ecosystem, when you hunt a forest, um, or you hunt a grassland by building out society on top of them or bringing in lumber to be able to power a city, um, or, um, uh, or, or fuel a factory, you don't just drive one species, but hundreds of species extinct. So I would say that there's a good mechanism that may also support, at least in my mind, a upsurge um, of extinctions on land, uh, more of them than we see in the sea. But a really good, uh, really good question, Jean-Baptiste. Well, th thank you for a really good answer. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I I'll take the next two uh, to John. I think because like, both the one from Felicity Barringer and Sergio Malo are actually linked to the governance, right? Like how do you actually govern uh, that Anthropocene ocean? The first one is asking you about the governance structure that actually allow the work of this corporation to operate. Uh, and there the distinction is made between the, the exclusive economic zones of each country, which I think will have obviously a different legal uh, governing system, and the unicity, uniqueness of the ocean, which is that two thirds of it actually lies beyond national jurisdiction, right? What is called the high seas when referring to the water column, what is called the area uh, with a capital A when it refers to the seabed. And, and this is considered shared inheritance of humanity and, and it's, it's much harder to enforce government. But John, what is your, what is your take on this one with different uh, industries such as mining, commercial fishing, shipping, and linking to the other one also, which is how to how to 
ensure that government capabilities have the, have the sorry the governments have the abilities to enforce environmental conservation measures. Yeah, and thanks, JP. Yeah, that's a great question because I have to remind ourselves that the ocean may be obviously one global ocean and body of water, but many of these industries are very different operating in the same space. And we still govern them. We still regulate them from governments in very different ways. And they're often not, uh, not linked, even though the impacts can be cumulative on the ocean environment and community. So you have many of these different industries are operating in the waters that are under national jurisdiction under the, of governments within 200 nautical miles of their coastline. Many that are operating both inside and outside in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And for those areas, as you mentioned, I think our colleague Robert at uh, Stockholm has this wonderful diagram that just shows all of the UN and international agencies linked to international agreements regulating some of these different industries within the ocean. And it's just like spaghetti on the wall. There are so many, whether it comes to the International Maritime Organization and shipping, whether it comes to International Seabed Authority and deep sea mining, regional fisheries management organizations and tuna. It's, um, it is really challenging to look across these and to think about this larger ocean economy and regulating the cumulative impacts of these different industries and uses in the ocean space. Um, so it is, I would say, uh, quite a big mix between both national governments and this uh, huge mess of different international agencies and agreements all trying to uh, mix together in the global ocean. <laughs> So it's a mess. I mean, bottom line, I was trying it, not it to use that mess. word, but yeah, <laughs> can be. No, but, but I mean, the, the, and this this is a nice transition to maybe like a recurring question, which comes several times. So I'll have to sort out all the all the comments of it, which which links both to your presentation, John, but also to yours, Jan, on on the role of those transnational corporations. How do you actually bring those companies to to take on a leadership position, um, on a stewardship position, right? And and stewardship means caring and caring means going beyond just for profit. So how do you incentivize? How do you get those companies within the realm of sustainability given the, the current structure? Maybe John, you give a first shot and then Jan will, will follow up. I'll take a quick answer though. I'll certainly defer to Jen who's, who's worked with these companies far longer than I have. Uh, I've spent most of my time working with governments, but I'm, I can just say I'm, I'm eager to see the extent to which these large companies recognize their role in the ocean and in the ocean economy and are willing to think about um, the, the potential that they could play as ocean stewards. But I'm also not naive. Uh, companies are driven by the constraints that they have by the interest in long-term profits and, and short-term profits and, and a range of the factors that, that Jan mentioned and will mention. But I just think that if we are in the Anthropocene, if this acceleration is happening, if we are industrializing the oceans, these companies are going to have to realize that their social license to operate, their long-term risk profile, their competitive advantage is all going to be tied to what state the ocean is in and how society sees the changes happening in the ocean place and particularly the distribution of benefits. Jan, maybe if you can follow up, there, there's a bunch of questions as well on linking natural capital to uh, capital markets, right? So I, I think that that's quite the spot on here with those companies. And I can I can tie some of those together. So somebody asked, what's the most leverage? And and I think it's a constellation or an assemblage of things that might come together. And um, one of them is, is a is a bit depressing. Um, is that given the direct impacts and are now very pressing and the space for externalities are much more constrained the direct impact of getting this wrong will be more punishing on organizations than it has been in the past because you can't just wander off if you've you know done over ohio you can't wander off and do over something else if the whole world is full so i think we're, we're up against a tighter limit but then it's a constellation between CEOs and managers. So people who are, who are charged with the responsibility for running organizations, looking very closely at what their industry peers are doing because, uh, because companies are quite vain. They want to look like others and they want to look better than others. So things like the World Benchmarking Alliance ranking of people actually has quite an impact on, on how organizations think about themselves. Combine then with their funders and their owners support 
And here it really depends, because one of the other question is that will, will the owners help? It depends who the owners are, because there's different categories of owners. So the, the best owners in terms of having sort of pro-social and pro-environmental profiles are the institutional investors. So they're the people that if, if you do have a, a pension, um, are investing our pensions on our behalf. Um, they are the most proactive, but they are also the most passive because they have a little bit of everyone. So they don't have concentrated ownership, they have spread out their ownership. Um, family investors and individual uh, owners are fantastic. If they believe, if they don't, it's useless. So it depends on their profile. And then other companies own companies, and that's quite a mixed bag. And then it depends on who owns them. So you've got some leverage off the owners, but it's not a constant leverage. It, it really varies. And then it depends whether or not capital markets can become smarter. So capital markets um, work on risk and return. And so there's quite a movement, um, a, you know, a positive movement. Um, firstly, there's a task force on climate related risk disclosures. So trying to get more um, non-financial information into the market that starts to articulate the climate change risk. And there's an equivalent um, process underway looking at nature related risks. So if you like, they will get smarter over time. But in all of this, it has to be underpinned by transparency. So really picking up Doug's point that the information about what organizations are doing has to be there. And then transparency doesn't buy you the full package. If you don't like what somebody's doing, you have to have the ability to sanction them in some way, either as a consumer or as an owner or as um, a regulator. Because if you haven't got the sanctions, all you've got is a, a wonderful visibility of how ghastly people are. You've got no ability to change their behavior. So I hope that sort of maybe ties several of the questions together. And each one of these moving parts have things going on in a good way to make um, organizations more accountable in the Anthropocene, but there's also vested interest in each one of those moving parts not to have them move as well. Thank you, quite, quite, <clears throat> quite a list and quite a comprehensive answer. I, I'd like to, to hear from Liz and to go back maybe to this notion of, of dependency and and like, because it's it's interesting, we flew in right from, from this human dependence into the big industrialization with all those fancy new technologies that open new realm of the ocean that were unthinkable maybe even 40 years ago. Um, from there, we moved to the 100 largest ocean companies, uh, but there are many more, of course. And from corporation, we're now talking about shareholders, finance, financial market. but. Let's bring it back to those communities, to those local communities who depend on the ocean. And, and I was really struck by the mismatch between the maps you showed of human dependency and the maps of the where the revenues from the ocean economy today were flowing, right? So, I mean, the, the, the question is not really a, a fair question, but what, what can we do? Like, are there any scientific partnership we're missing or bridges we need to build? if we were to achieve sustainable ocean management and how? Well, uh, so a very small question with an easy answer. No, it's, um, I, I mean, incredibly complex. And I think um, if I'm thinking about what we wanna do in the next couple of decades, figuring out some of the answers to those questions would be at the top of my list. Um, I do think though, and in listening to sort of, to John's characterization of the spaghetti on the wall of all of the actors in place and, um, and in Jan's um, uh, discussion about the potential for companies to be stewards, I think that the, the, there is actually, if one wants to take a glass half full approach here is that um, there are a lot of actors. And so if one actor is not stepping up to the challenge, there are other actors and other lovers we might try to pull. So, you know, and I think one of the ones that we haven't explored and figured out how best to address is basically a lack of voice and accountability to coastal communities um, in these discussions. And so I think that there's a lot that we can do um, to get um, governments to support companies uh, who want to make a difference and who want to be advocates for specific things that governments can then enact the regulations and policies to support them. Um, at the same time, I think um, governments can take a stronger role in, in sanctioning companies that that have practices that, that are hurting coastal communities. Um, and, and I think companies themselves and governments both need to look at what kinds of 
trade policies and other policies they're doing that are potentially jeopardizing the delivery of key benefits to coastal populations that need them most. So not, not an easy answer. Um, I wish I had it, but I think that there's a lot of opportunities to kind of um, pull different levers within the system to try to get to a better place. Is, is any of the, it's given the scope of the question, is any of the other panelists wants to, to jump in maybe and, and add something to, to that? Thanks so much, Liz. Well, Jean-Baptiste, I was gonna just add a, maybe a, a nugget of an example, which speaks to the question, the mega question that uh, um, you put to Liz, but also just to this thread that we're talking about, about how do we actually, um, create some sense of responsibility and some incentive through these different kinds of uh, business structures to create change as, as businesses grow in the oceans. But um, the, the, the nugget of an example that I wanted to use was just an effort that we have going in, in here in California, which tries to do just that, which is um, actually use data, as I was suggesting, which is not a silver bullet for trying to fix all of these different challenges with uh, growing pains for blue acceleration, but can be very empowering. And then to try to build transparency for impact in some of these companies and industries, and then try to connect people and governments to this process of um, you know, who's doing good and who needs to improve. The, the example is just for an issue associated with global um, maritime commerce and ship strikes with whales. So another minor example, but um, matters to whales. Um, one of the top causes of uh, deaths for endangered whales uh, in, in, in the world is actually collisions with ships and a lot more ship traffic beginning as our, um, as our, uh, as our world becomes more international in terms of commerce. 90% or so of the products that we have around us come on the back of, uh, of ships and maritime commerce. So um, one thing that we did was we tried to use um, big data techniques to actually look at where ships were slowing down in some of these areas where they're asked voluntarily to slow down so that they don't run over ships. When ships slow down, the collision risk is lower with endangered whales. And then we just used a few filtering algorithms to create grades for these different shipping companies. And remember, of course, in John's presentation, some of these shipping companies, Maris, CMA, CGM, these are the largest ocean companies in the world. Well, we gave them grades the same way that we would give students in class grades. And then we, um, one of the great challenges with the ocean economy is connecting it back to people because the steps between sustainability or um, response, environmental responsibility and the average person on the street are much greater. And the, the links are more opaque when it comes to the ocean economy than it will come to um, you know, things that are more familiar, but we tried to tell the story of how the things that you buy in whatever your big retail store is where you live, you know, in the US, why a product on the shelf at Walmart actually connects to shipping, which connects to whales, which connects to good and bad companies that are delivering your shoes or your laptops. Um, and then gave them some data, both the companies, um, their clients and consumers, this information to be able to make that link and to help some of the clients for these big ocean companies finally have data that help them choose, okay, well, who is an A-grade um, maritime shipping partner and who is a D-grade maritime shipping partner? So I just wanted to throw that in the mix, you know, to maybe take it down to a case study example of how we can actually use data to create some of this visibility and transparency around sustainability and help to encourage um, either voluntarily or through regulator, regulatory pathways. You can imagine governments looking at the same grades and saying, wow, okay, we have a whole bunch of Fs, maybe we need a regulatory lever instead of hoping that they voluntarily change. But a specific case study of how we can maybe initiate this change process that everyone else in the panel is describing. I really like that, Douglas, like the actual case study, the, the success story as well. I think please feel free to share those uh, and we need them. It also speaks to the to the notion of benchmarking, right? And there are a, a growing number of initiatives or indices and, and Jan mentioned some of those to benchmark those companies and try to establish those kinds of indices. Then of course, the question is where the data comes from to initiate those grades and to be able even to, to rate those companies or their third party audits and so on. So it's not the silver bullet, but as you said, it's, it's one step in the right direction. Speaking of examples, we have a question, a tough one, but I think in a very relevant one about whether anyone has examples of organization like big organization Jan, tackling equity effectively. Because I think that this, and this is a difficult one, but it is a bit the elephant in the room, right? Where everyone is talking about this blue economy and, and what would make it truly blue is that it's not only sustainable, but it's also just and fair and it's equitable. 
uh, it's one thing to say it, it's another one to implement it. And if anything, the different speakers today show that we're far from uh, an equitable today uh, ocean economy. Do we have examples of companies and organizations tackling equity? Turning towards you, Jan. Some. It's, it's quite complicated on the equity front. And, and if we particularly look at human rights abuse and, and labor abuse, um, looking at forced bonded and, and, and child labor, these are um, endemic social harms in, in the, the system. They're endemic social harms in, in seafood, but they're also harms in um, many consumer products and also lots of agricultural products. So there is a sense in which our economies have been designed to exploit people for, for private profits. Linking, however, that harm to an individual organization is not straightforward if you've got lots of subcontracting and you've got these long chains whereby um, you know, I might be buying from a consolidator who's bought from someone else who is then you know, outsourcing um, production to, to a lot of um, you know, smaller organizations. And, and that happens in agriculture quite extensively, um, but also in clothing manufacture. So in that respect, sometimes it's the structure of the industry that makes the tracing and holding organizations accountable very difficult. Having said that, um, one of the, it's not a great act, um, but the UK has a Modern Slavery Act, um, which asks organisations to say something about their due diligence. And most of the reporting is quite lousy, but some people would do good examples of it. So the people that, um, and they're UK based because if you like, they've been pushed to try to do it first, is um, M&S, Marks and Spencers, a uh, food retailer. So you can go on their website and you can ask for a, a product and then find out where the labor force is and where do they own factories and where do they subcontract factories and then find out if there's been you know, any problems with that. Another one is um, the Pentland Brands. Now you would have never heard of Pentland Group. It's a, it's a large family owned business in the UK, but they um, sell you all your Speedo. Um, you know, they've got lots of brands that you would be buying as a matter of course. Um, they have a similar thing, but then also they, they give you information on how serious some of the labor rights abuses that they've found. And they, they categorize the percentage of problems they've found and how many are severe, et cetera. And again, they have this map of where all this, these production systems are. So because we have created a you know, worldwide economy where people can be working anywhere on products that then are passed along these chains, those links are only really starting to be articulated really clearly by organizations. They, organizations only have a direct relationship with their, their first set of suppliers. So to reach beyond that, they have to have some other mechanisms in place. So um, somebody was mentioning um, in, um, uh, Thailand earlier on, and then the improvement that took place in Thailand, well, that's because there was a, a cross-sectoral approach within a country. And that seems like a really strong way for then a corporation and a country intersection to come into play. So it's, it's, it's really tricky there, but there are some people around who are doing some very good things and not saying anything, but there are some people around that can show you how much information they can give you should you wish to um, um, find out more about them. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> no, this is good. This is these comprehensive uh, answers, and I, I think it's great. We still have a bit of time. We're we're approaching to the end, though, with ten minutes left. So so we'll we'll keep doing it around and maybe shorten the answers uh, if if we can. But uh, I mean, the point is also the, the quality more than the quantity. John, I'm turning towards you because we we heard a little bit of it from John. Like we often talk about corporations, like you know, full per period, or like the private sector as if it was a, like an homogenous entity, like in particular in the academic literature, right? It's like, oh, the role of transnational corporation, but it's obviously not the case, like different sectors, different industries, different companies based on their ownership and so on will have different incentives. Uh, if you look at the Ocean 100, I think it's pretty obvious, you said it yourself, more than half of your Ocean 100 or almost half are offshore oil and gas companies, which are likely to have very different incentives to become ocean stewards or to engage in sustainability initiative than let's say seafood companies whose resources depend and, and are is renewable and, and depends on, on long-term sustainability. How do you intend to deal with this inherent heterogeneity when, when you move on with this cohort of Ocean 100? 
Yeah, no, that's absolutely right, JB. I mean, we use the ocean in a variety of different ways and in a variety of industries as, as part of this blue acceleration. We haven't talked about uh, some of the emerging ones that, you know, Doug, you mentioned there's biotech, there's deep sea mining. I mean, we, we, we have a snapshot of what the Ocean 100 looked like in 2018. What it's going to look like in 2030 could be very, very different as these industries emerge in, in very different ways. So it is a challenge. My hope, and I, I don't know yet, I want to start to, now that we know who they are, I want to start to talk with them and engage and see if these industries at least see, see a sense of a shared sense of responsibility relation to the ocean space, the ocean resources that they're all using. And if there might be even some maybe industry specific, but ocean wide impacts uh, that these, these companies could undertake. Um, so that, that will be my hope to, and question to see. That's the opportunity. The, the opportunity is if there are a relatively small number of them, yes, that has concerns about concentration and power and, and what Liz mentioned on sort of whose voice is being the loudest in ocean governance. But it also might mean there's the opportunity that there are fewer to regulate, fewer to interact with to really have an impact. And so even if they are across very different industries, if they see a shared connection to the ocean, there might be opportunities then for, for action. Thanks. I'm, I'm turning towards Douglas. We had an early question, which I kept a little bit for later in terms of the COVID emergency, of course, and, and the current situation. Do you think the current COVID emergency and future pandemics will have an impact in the human nature relationship? If so, could we expect contrary to the general expectation, a stronger detachment from nature? I'll, I'll add one to make a cocktail of it, which is, which is a, a further down about the land-sea interaction. I think another really good question saying, well, you know, what happens on land doesn't stay inland. What happens in the ocean doesn't necessarily stay in the ocean. So we haven't talked much about this land-sea interaction throughout the, the different presentation, yet it's there, right? When we talk about plastic, most of the plastic ending in the ocean, uh, 8 million tons a year on average, and it comes originally from land. And, and, and a lot of the seafood and feed resources coming from the ocean end up feeding beefs on land as well. So you have all those interconnection. Can you take a shot at, the, at those two two-folded question? Sure, Jean-Baptiste. Houston. let me try to take on your charge of being succinct in answers too. Um, so the, the first question about uh, COVID and uh, our relationship with the oceans and the blue acceleration or marine industrial revolution, whatever you wish to call it, is complex and important. Um, and it's not a short answer. And I, uh, in fact, many, perhaps some folks on the panel as well, um, uh, tried to shape some thoughts about how COVID is changing our relationship in the oceans. I have an essay that I wrote trying to look industry by industry about what some of these COVID um, impacts um, were. But let me pick one example from that thought cloud, which is my own exercise of trying to understand this changing relationship, particularly since, um, a good question, since the, 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 the um, audience member asked this about the human nature relationship. So um, I think one very particular impact on the human nature relationship and the blue economy or blue acceleration happens in the track of ocean tourism, which is huge. I don't think we appreciate how large the ocean, blue ocean and tourism economy is. You know, it's roughly $390 billion globally, this, um, this, uh, all of the jobs and services associated with with hospitality and travel um, as it relates to blue ocean economy. So that's been completely disrupted, of course, because of COVID and the impacts on travel, which has been um, devastating for you know, so many places, and particularly in the conversation about equity um, and Liz's points about mapping dependency on ocean resources has been particularly devastating for island states, um, but other coastal places um, in less wealthy um, regions, which have immense assets um, in the oceans they share with the world through this track of ocean tourism that they were no longer sharing and that were assets for wealth as well as being assets for um, you know their, their inherent value is biodiversity resource beautiful coral reefs and, and bird rich mangroves that people would come from all over the world to see well anyway that entire economy has been put on pause meaning that there's been a lot of vulnerability opened up um, in that track, meaning that the stewards on the ground that were looking after these ocean resources, coral reefs that they were sharing with the world, now perhaps are changing that nature human that they are reevaluating or, or that relationships become more complex. 
they were, you know, as I say, stewards for this resource that they wanted to keep healthy, coral reefs for, next, the, not, for another hundred years, not just because they're amazing species on, their, on those reefs, because that was an amazing portfolio of life they could share and attract people in to spend in their local economies. So, you know, that's something that I think um, uh, has given us a moment of pause, which both, um, you know, is, has, has allowed us to look with a new lens about our relationship with our ocean, with ocean nature as an asset. Hopefully that reboots because I think that's such an important way to create value for nature and, and ocean biodiversity. I should say just relatedly, um, another um, very small nugget of changing relationship with COVID and nature, which may go the other way, which may intensify our relationship with nature is just something that's happening within my country, within the U.S., which is now, um, in fact, today, our, our new president has announced interest in creating a civilian conservation corps, which would be creating more jobs, partly to help take some of the stress off our hugely impacted um, domestic economy around trying to restore nature. And um, if that takes off, and if you create more jobs to restore nature, um, perhaps that will bring us closer together. So some things that are you know, making our relationship more complex, um, and some things that perhaps are bringing us closer together as a result of COVID. I wonder if I should table the other response just in the interest of... Uh, um... in, in the interest of time, we're going to move yeah. on. But thank, I mean, I think it was worth it. I think it was really worth it to, to, to mention and dive into that. I tried so hard to be succinct, Sean. <laughs> Thanks for trying. <laughs> no, but, but since we are indeed uh, approaching to the end, um, I want to round up with giving a chance to each speaker to briefly, really, give like a few concluding words. Um, and starting with you, Liz, on, on the Anthropocene Ocean, and also, if you want, of course, don't but feel free not to, but reflecting on the idea that, as I said earlier, we are starting the UN decade of ocean science, like this year, 2021, and in 2030, it will be over. So let's say we were in 2030, we're all scientists here on this panel, what would you like to have seen scientists done and achieved over the last 10 years? We're now in 2030, guys, so brace it. So I, I, I mean, I think um, just reflecting on, on all of the wisdom from, from the other panelists and, and what we've discussed today, I'm really hoping that by 2030, we have a more diverse set of voices and ideas to bring to bear on a lot of the problems that we're facing in oceans and ways to really um, create that accountability and, um, and voice, particularly for our coastal communities and smallholder um, uh, fishermen and aquaculture um, livelihoods so that we can really um, uh, bring, bring their voices in a more fulsome way into discussions around the use of our oceans and who benefits from them. And my hope is that the, the spaghetti um, governance, spaghetti on the wall governance structure has also found ways to really um, uh, create redundancy and, and um, ability to, to bring about a more sustainable ocean. Thanks. John, a few words. Uh, the world's biggest ocean based companies create a global ocean fund or ocean tax to, uh, to help fund ocean public goods that we need and that um, governments protect the, the coastal grounds for small scale fishers and that, as Liz mentioned, they have a greater voice. Thanks. Douglas? I think I don't mean to suggest in my um, my portrait of a, a of a ramping up of, of, of a blue acceleration that uh, the ocean undersea is going to look more like New York City on land and by 2030. But I would predict that 2030, 2040, 2050, the ocean is going to continue to look a lot different and is going to change at a much faster pace than probably we expect, which means that the species here in this ecosystem, um, policymakers, scientists, um, folks that are connected to business, we have a really great responsibility in the years between here and 2030, and that is to get more data assets, thought assets, research assets, and importantly, apply those for trying to forge this future for a rapidly changing oceans and do it fast. I think at the next few years and the stretch between now and 2030, maybe the years that determine what the ocean will be like for the next 100 years. So we'll see what it looks like, but just putting on all our shoulders a grave sense of responsibility to shape that future in these next few years. Point taken, pressure is on. <laughs> Thanks, Douglas. Jan, a, a few final words before we hand over to, to Laurie or Anne for, for the next series advertising. 
2030, organisational activities uh, will be within a robust social and ecological governance framework. Um, it will be fully supported by financial systems, whether it be an ocean tax or it be you know, some, some way of um, you know, raising money to support the activities, and that organisations themselves would have become corporate biosphere stewards. And that organisational science, such as, um, you know, I'm a representative of that community, that we have actually um, had a core contribution alongside the ecologists and humanities and, and the social equity people to achieving those outcomes. So that's my hope for 2030. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much to all four panelists once again for a fascinating discussion, for joining in in the first time, but making it a really interesting discussion. I, I thank you uh, deeply. I, and now I hand over to the NETCAP project for the next conversation and, and say thank you to all the audience and, and the, the number of questions. I wish we had more time to answer all of them, but really appreciated uh, the comments, the feedbacks and, and the, the brilliant questions. Thank you, everyone on behalf of the panelists and myself. Thank you so much, Jean-Baptiste and all the panelists for such a fabulous first session of the Natural Capital Conversations. I learned so much and have lots of follow-ups that I would like to do with each of you. Um, when Liz's opening talk, she talked about three of four different types of human dependence on, on oceans that her team categorized. The fourth, the cultural one was left unexplored. And I just wanted to mention that the next two natural capital conversations that we'll be hosting are focusing on cultural connections. The first one on February 2nd from 10 to 11 Pacific time is focusing on cultural benefits um, and the ways in which humans are connected to water. And then on February the 16th from 10 to 11 Pacific again, is a focus on cultural benefits and the connection between uh, people and land through cultural dimensions. You can register for the next conversations at the link shown on the screen here and we'll have a link in the follow-up email. And with that, I would like to thank everybody so much for joining today. It was really inspiring and I look forward to seeing you at future engagements. Thanks so much, everyone.